And of course, we're here for FL Digi, as it says on the schedule. Um, we're going to start out with first just a little intro of what amateur radio is. There's no PowerPoints. There's no there's no slides. This is going to be a demo just to show oh, yeah, you right. what things are. Um, so how many here know what amateur radio is to some level? At the bottom. Okay. Um, you know, of course, the image most people have of ham radio is kind of like walking on. You're sitting there saying, hello, 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 hello. And certainly there is that aspect of amateur radio. Yeah. But we're going to show you how some of it has changed and how it can be used in a, in a digital world. Ham radio is just, or amateur radio is just that, it's radio. It, it's a set of frequencies that the government sets aside for people that obtain an amateur license to use. Now it can be used for voice, it can be used for Morse code, but it can also be used for digital, which is where what we're going to show you today comes into play. Uh, an amateur radio can be used to talk to somebody 20 feet away, or it can be used to talk to somebody around the world, depending on how you figure it out, depending on antennas and what you set up and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and the great thing about it is no infrastructure in between. You know, I know we're all computer people and tech people and internet people, but, but we also know there's times that, that stuff doesn't exist. Sometimes it's bad. Uh, and, and one of the appeals for me starting with it was just that. All I have to have is a radio and, and a power supply and an antenna, and I can reach out pretty much wherever I can configure that stuff to get out. Now, of course, there's considerations of power and antenna, you know, the higher the better, all those kind of things. But that's the general idea. <clears throat> and just say, trying to get something out for you guys to see. Okay, well, while I'm waiting on this, one of the things that you guys may have seen, if some of you attended it over there, that, that cross applies is SDRs, Software Defined Radios. You know, they had that, that speech over there, they talked about it. That's used pretty heavily now in the amateur radio world as well. It's not just for networks. Um, You can take an SDR, you take one of those dongles he talked about, and set it up on your computer and start seeing some of the stuff even that we're going to be doing here, getting that information that's out there. Because even though we're in the day and age of cell phones and internet and stuff, there's still a lot of radio waves going out there, there's still a lot of stuff happening, people talking back and forth. And it's, it's interesting, you know, you can pull down even... Uh, satellite images that they broadcast, satellite TV. Uh, the, the government is constantly putting out information, whether it's weather or other types of things like that from it that you can gather. And you don't even need a license to receive. You only need it to transmit. Do you want me to talk a few minutes while you try to get that back the pro to work? <laughs> if you don't mind, please. All right. So has anybody here ever used a computer? <laughs> Okay, whoever didn't raise your hand isn't participating in this live. Everybody in this room has used a computer. All right, has anybody here used a radio? Anybody here used a, a, a cell phone? Okay, every single one of you that, that raised your hand just now, you've used a radio. Because you know what the difference between this and this is? A screen, a processor, and the frequency it operates on. Except this one's a hell of a lot more powerful. Okay, this one can go a few, a, a couple miles. This one can talk to satellites. Okay, and I know that sounds funny, but but you can talk to a satellite on a half a milliwatt. Okay, it doesn't take a whole lot of power. These are not very powerful. Operate in a higher frequency range, and that's why you've got to have a cell tower 
every couple of miles to be able to handle these things and be able to communicate. All right. So if I want to make a phone call, what what is the path that this takes? It goes from here to a cell tower, and then can anybody else tell me what happens next? It goes to a call center. Okay. Goes to a call center via probably fiber. Okay. Or some type of backhaul system. Radio tower to radio tower to a central to a central telco. And then does anybody know what happens when it gets to that central telco? IP network switch. Very good, Donnie. Very good. Okay, it could go to an uh, uh, to an IP switch somewhere. Eventually, depending on where that call is going to be, it's going to go up into space and it's going to go to a satellite to go from from one place to another. All right. So you've gone from a radio to a landline to a satellite, which isn't any more than a very high frequency radio with a whole lot of bandwidth. All right. So there's a whole lot of infrastructure involved in getting anything from here to here or to another phone. It's dependent on a whole lot of moving parts. Well, imagine, if you will, with this setup right here, I can send email from anywhere. I don't need all that infrastructure. Okay? I can pick up and I can talk and I can talk uh, uh, 50 miles away or I can talk 100 miles away using the knowledge that I've gained through amateur radio. I can bounce signals off the ionosphere. I can bounce signals off the moon to talk to people on the, on the other side of the world. Okay? And now what we're going to do specifically is not talk about, I, I could spend the next three weeks talking about amateur radio and not even begin to scratch the surface of all the different things that you can do with it. But what we're going to do here is we're going to show you how to get data from one computer to another using a couple applications with zero infrastructure involved. For example, uh, uh, people in sailboats in the middle of the ocean can't reach a cell tower, but they can still send email through a system called SailMail or WinLink. All right. So, and uh, the guys up in the in the International Space Station, they don't use cell phones. They use radios. Whenever we talk to satellites that are on the other on the other side of the of the the uh, solar system, all they're using is a computer and a radio with a with a satellite thing. All right. So what we're doing here, what doesn't seem impressive between this antenna and this antenna, you know, we're right here together. We're just doing that for demonstration purposes. The, the idea is, is that I don't need a satellite, I don't need a landline, I don't need anything else. Some of the other places that, that this would apply, a lot of you may be into Raspberry Pis and getting information to and from. Well, having an amateur radio license allows you to operate in frequency ranges that aren't possible. You can, you can uh, operate with an amount of power, one and a half kilowatts worth of power, to communicate back and forth with those kind of devices. So you're not limited to just being able to use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth signals to, to send and receive control commands or to send and receive files. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's, there's, one, uh, there's one repeater here, in the, and a repeater is just kind of like a cell tower for handy talkies or walkie talkies. Um, that the, con the command and control unit for that is a raspberry, there's a raspberry Pi sitting in the building up there that people can use, that can contact by radio that is used to control that repeater system. So I can get on here with, with the computer and start sending telnet commands to that raspberry Pi to make it shut down that remote radio or open it up. And I could do that from miles and miles away, not just a few hundred feet. So are you getting somewhere finally? Getting there. These Macs that always work. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's not the Mac, it's the Mac. No, it's the Mac. And the operator.
Okay, so, so with that in mind, we're, we're going to demonstrate just one simple thing, and this is a program called FL Digit. Wait, wait, it's showing Amanda's... Oh, you got to delete some stuff. That's what... Okay, it's probably pushed down too far. Check it out. All right, so... All right, here's what you need to do. Pad on speaker text. Take out Amanda's hugs and stuff. It's probably like... Take out everything. Uh, what, 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 who are these guys now? Which ones are these? <laughs> Which? They should. Let's see. I gotta scroll down. Okay. Rob's uh, done all the uh, intro he stuff. Came here first. Wait, what, who's this? Very well, of course. Oh, sorry. Turn it down. There are. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, In addition to the program we're going to show yeah. you, there's a right. lot more out there. There's a lot of programs to do it. Um, there's free SDRs. There's. From the amateur radio side, there's a program called Echo Link that you could even download on your phone and talk to other ham radio people. But what's what we're covering is just what he said, this FL video, in that it will let you send stuff over no infrastructure. We have to do that. Like he said, emails, text, even just type into somebody, or even attachments. You, know, you can send text files, Excel files. Um, again, back to that no infrastructure, nothing in between who you're sending to. Um, this program that is not up there. This is available for Windows, Mac, Linux. It's open source. Everybody likes open source. It's all out there. And you can use it to, to operate a range of equipment, which is what I'll talk about first, and then we'll show it actually working. In that, I can have just a laptop and a $30 radio, and I can transmit and receive, again, documents, text, anything you're sending back and forth. Uh, it's it's like the old modems. I mean, I know some of you guys have seen the old modems. You sit down on the cradle, right? You hear the noise. Anybody ever use those? Yeah. <coughs> okay, we got a couple of you. <laughs> and that's exactly what it sounds like. Maybe a little bit like when you used to dial up to AOL. You would just hear it all the time. And that's what it is. Slower, but it's there. Um, and you would just hold this up, and you would key it like you were talking to somebody, hold it up to your speakers, and it would sound like, this just put in a little finish, even if it's not spelled right. Turn this on up. Okay. And there's your test. And that's often what happens in messing with stuff is problems. In just a second. Oh, it's coming back. There. Yeah, I think it can't handle the radio and the uh, and the video on the same link here. So we want to switch that up. So this broad Windows computer. What? <laughs> Man, that'll get you thrown out of here. <laughs> Three people just died. <laughs> My heart's still pounding over that. It had to wake you up somehow. Yeah. Let's try that again. Let me get this back over here. <clears throat> so, what was the name of the package you were using? It's FL Digi. Back to our tales. Yeah. 
This is what we're going to have, right? Yeah. Now that first test, I'm just sending CW, Morse code. Very, very slow. You're not going to be sending any uh, text documents over that, of course. But a lot of people think of ham radio or also amateur radio as Morse code, and you can do that with this. You don't have to learn it. I haven't learned it. It doesn't require it anymore for the license. It can be useful, but I don't have it. The machine can do it. But if we speed things up, we choose a different mode. I mean, you don't have to remember all this. This is just exposure. Yeah, exactly. This program, it, it's it's kind of like if you've never seen Photoshop before. There's a whole lot of options. There's a whole lot of stuff in there. You could give a, a whole day class on going through each of the options. Um, it, it, the first part I'm going to show you doesn't require anything special other than a handheld radio and your computer and turning on the software. The, the, all these yeah. different modes, once you read about them and look them up, is, is yeah, just yeah. based on what frequency you're using, how much bandwidth it's going to use. Some of them have error correction, some of them don't. You know, if you got a good signal between and, and you got plenty of bandwidth for running it, you don't have to worry about the error correction. You send the stuff super quick. But realistically, most of what we use it on anyway would be HF. Which is going to be low bandwidth. You can't have it very wide. I think it's what 300k or something. Like that. 300 baud. 300. Okay, so let, let's scale back for just a second. And talk about what you're looking at here, all right? So we've got a, com uh, a computer program that's got a software modem, right? Everybody here knows what a modem is, and all that modem is doing is producing sounds. Each one of those different protocols or operating modes that he had up there just use a different series of sounds or different protocols in order to communicate that information. And the wider the bandwidth or the wider the, the spectrum that's used there, the more information that you can transfer in between the two systems. All right? So, so really all we're talking about is we're just changing from sending, uh, sending signals out across an Ethernet cable or uh, Wi-Fi and using a radio for that transmission. Back in the day, and you could think like Matthew Broderick from War Games, everybody see that movie? Uh, all right. So, you know, whenever he wanted to do that, he picked up his telephone, popped it up onto an acoustic modem that transmitted sound or, or translated those electrical signals into sound, used a telephone line for transmission to a telephone on another that translated that sound back into electrical impulses. So that's all that's happening here. We've just replaced the telephone line with radio waves. All right? Now we're going to send a test to adjust that. That's it. This was my modem in the cradle, just like you talked about. If someone was on the frequency on the other end, had this running, they'd have picked it up. So I bet I believe someone is. Let's try that. You ready? Yep. Go ahead. Okay, so, so you can see I answered him from this computer back there. Except, it, while that's the lowest tech that you can possibly use, what we've got up here is we've got radios that this radio has a sound card built into it. So instead of just acoustically coupling with it, where I'm just sitting here holding it and letting it, letting it transfer, there's a whole, it's not a real clean signal. You can't pick that up real well and all that kind of stuff. Well, this radio, I've got, and there's also other devices, which Aaron's getting ready to pull out here. That's called a signal link device. This is, at first, it's just a sound card in a box. But it also has controls on it to control a radio that doesn't have all the stuff built into it. So, you can imagine it would be pretty tedious to sit there and hold this thing every time you want to sit and let off every time you don't. You can do it. The next step, it's only about 100 bucks, 90 bucks, 
you get one of these. You can get a cable, and they have jumpers inside where you adjust depending on which radio you have. You hook it up to here. You could hook it up via USB, and it'll handle transmitting and receiving. You don't even have to hear the noise anymore if you don't want to. You can turn it down. The, the advantage to this is it can work with several radios. You know, you can have one in your car, you can have a handheld, you can have a big one, and you just change it a little bit, change your cable, and it'll do everything you want. And then the, the best option are radios like these, like you said, where this is all built in. All I got to do is hook up one USB cable, and not only will it send and receive, but all this other stuff it can control. I can control what frequency we're on, everything. It'll set the radio to do that control. Which we go ahead and turn it on. Hook it up. It just uses COM port communication to talk with these devices. Sometimes it so while he's right. working on that, keep in mind, like I said, right here this isn't real impressive, but last night I was using this exact same setup with a much larger antenna talking to a guy in Venezuela. Just, just me and him. Nothing else in between. And he had a similar type of setup on the other side. I apologize for the delays. I did pre flight, flight this last night, and it, it's not playing nicely today, of course. There we go. Now what you're seeing in the upper left hand corner here is the current frequency that we're on, which is this is one that's allowed by the FCC, and then they have certain frequency set aside. Um, and that's, a, that's 144 megahertz. So if you compare that to 2.4 gigahertz, that's referring to the, the wavelength that we're using. And each wavelength has different characteristics and, and uh, as far as, as how it behaves. So, so we're instead of using a uh, short, the uh, ultra high frequency wave, we're using one that each individual wave that that occurs is about two feet long, or I'm sorry, six feet long. It's two meters. Is how long one wavelength is. Same. This time I'm going to send to him just from the computer, without having to hold anything. And it's going to kill our connection. <laughs> this is a great deal. You, you would have seen the same thing that you did before, as far as what came across. The difference is I'm not sitting here holding the radio, yeah. and you don't have to hear it. Now, there's some advantage to hearing it. Sometimes, once you do this for a while, you can kind of figure out what mode they might be using. So, so I'm sending from here to, to his radio, and he doesn't have something hooked up right, or he would be seeing the signal yeah, right there. Where did they get that sound of? Donkey Kong or something? <laughs> yeah, well, okay, and, and, and you'll hear that each one, that just happens to be the, because the, the way that it's encoding that data is it, it's either frequency changes or phase changes in the sound, all right? So if you can imagine Morse code is a series of dits and dots, right? So it might be, yeah, everybody knows SOS, right? Three dots, three dashes, yeah. three dots. Okay? Or whatever, I forget. I don't know Morse code. <laughs> computer does it for me. Yeah. Hey, but it's that same kind of thing. It's just, it's got certain sounds that are going to produce certain symbols. Oh, okay. Okay? And, and each one uses a different scheme to, to achieve different results. Just like some of those protocols have forward error correction in them, okay. So it's going to it's going to 
it's going to make certain sounds and repeat certain sounds so that so that in the application can interpret those um, so so each different protocol and we'll do a different ones just so you can hear some of the different sounds it, it's some of them sound just like white noise out there some of them are very distinctive um, and then some of them like that morse code you can recognize right away because you've heard it several times all right here just let me know whenever you're ready to try something else. i'm trying to keep from kicking off the video every time i hit send or transmit it's not working too well so won't you just stick with your radio instead of your main radio instead of using different devices so we can show them a couple of things that's what i'm doing now you put me uh but you got your radio on there let's i'll, I'll do a couple of different sounding protocols for them. Here, I'll turn mine on. All right, so this one you'll you'll probably recognize. Right, CW. That's just the the dips and the dots and all that kind of good stuff. All right. Here's one that's that's uh, pretty old school. This one's called Ready. R-T-T-Y, that sounds, stands for radio teletype. So way back in the days, remember how they had the uh, the stop tickers? They had a little piece of tape coming out of it. You see them in old, old shows. It's like, uh, and they're reading all the symbols off of it. Yeah. Well, that's radio teletype, right? Mm -hmm. That's how that's how that worked back in the day, is, is they just broadcast a radio signal. Somebody sold these uh, stop ticker devices that interpreted those radio signals and spit out uh, tape with it. So that's that's what a ready signal sounds like. Uh, now here's one that's a, a little bit more modern. Modern. This is called Thor 50 times two. Okay. So this is a real wide bandwidth, um, and this would still send data slower than uh, the 56k modem. Way slower. We're talking like down to 300 baud. Kind of, kind of speed. So it's not, not super fast. But once again, you're talking about no infrastructure communications. <laughs> yeah, okay. So R two D two. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and that was the Thor. Yeah, that one. That one's called four fifty times two. And one of the advantages to it is number one, it, it's a lot wider bandwidth. Um, so instead of sending uh, uh, characters at like ten words per minute, you're talking a couple hundred words per minute with that protocol. And then if you if you talk about something that that's real wide bandwidth, this is going to be. Uh, PS5250 RC6. That means there's going to be six different streams of data uh, that you'll be able to see on the waterfall up here in a minute whenever Aaron gets everything every, everything set up there. So this is the same information uh, that I've been sending in a, in a much faster protocol. So that sounded way different. Did anybody notice anything uh, similar about every one of those transmissions? Ah, uh, the beginning. Right, the beginning. That's what I was about to say. Yep, the very beginning, every single one of them, listen, listen to the first, okay, the first second is going to be just a straight carry, carrier, okay? That, that's used to just open up the mic um, and, and give it a second. So it's just going to be a steady tone. But I want, I want you to listen to the next tone before the kind of noise, all right? Then we'll talk about what that is. Okay, 
So now I want to do it in a, in a different mode. I want to go back to that uh, ready for a minute, that radio teletype. Oh, never mind, that mode won't do it. Let me go back to the Thor 50 times two. Okay, so you heard that steady tone, and then there was a, a short, and you heard the set that same tone every single time. Well, that's a handshake. That's a way that my computer is telling anybody else out there that's listening what protocol's getting ready to, to follow. So we don't even have to know ahead of time exactly what protocol that we're going to use between the two systems to start communicating. Because we might switch mode. Some are better at sending keyboard to keyboard. Okay, just like a just like a chat system. Uh, other other protocols are better at sending uh, pictures. Okay, you, you can actually send photographs from one system to another. Other ones are are better at uh, error correction. So if you needed one hundred percent accuracy with with what you're sending from one place to another. So uh, an example would be we're we're a part of a group called Ares, which is a, a Amateur Radio Emergency Services, which means we'll, we'll help groups like uh, uh, you know, down in Puerto Rico where all the infrastructure has gone away, where there's a group of 50 amateur radio operators that were sent uh, as a part of a group with the Red Cross to provide communications from their, their, uh, their Red Cross shelters, and they sent health and welfare information back here to the United States without any other kind of infrastructure. They just used radios and these type of applications to be able to send email directly from Puerto Rico back to radio stations back here in the United States to get email to say, hey, I'm okay and I'm alive, kind of thing. Well, if you can imagine, we, we might use one protocol for one part of the conversation and then another protocol for another part of it. So. By having that little header information or that handshake right at the beginning, so you're sending. By having that handshake right at the beginning, it it'll change the application so that you can see. Maybe we should hit the Windows machine. Up. I think we should. What, what kind of? Yeah, Mini or what? I don't. I don't have. Well, I think you need a mini dis is a mini display port on the surfaces, and, but that's VGA. Well, yeah, it would be better. It should be about the same. All we've got is HDMI on the uh, coming from the projector. Oh, then that won't be me any good. I'm not gonna take. I should have brought my whole backpack in. I don't have any other interfaces with me. <laughs> I tested all this yesterday, and of course it worked. Today it doesn't. So clearly, it always works when you're not presenting. That's exactly, exactly right. right. You need any software other than FLBD? Pardon? Do you need any software other than FLBD? I've got it downloaded my whole one there. He'd have to configure and everything for you. Yeah, the, yeah, so the rig control is rigged. Take a little longer. Maybe you can only show what you send. I'm, I'm fine with that. I don't think I can send any. Even if they can see it on the other end, just get the application up there. I'll talk about it all day. Is the protocol negotiation a feature of the software, or is that the sound card? It, it's a feature of the software, okay? Because, once again, the radio piece of this, all that is is a method of transmission. I mean, you could be using a telephone line. Um, even a network card's just a, a, a different kind of modem, yeah. right? Yeah. It's turning the it's turning the data into a signal that can be transported across Ethernet, right? Yeah. So all all we're doing is using a software modem to translate what this application's doing here and changing that into sound so that it works across the radio. That's really all we're doing, and this is just one app one application that can do that. So let's see. Let's see if we can see what some of those signals look like down here at the beginning. Uh, 
Can you decrease? Because you're showing like 6,000 uh, kilohertz there. Okay. I want that water. I think so. No, that's right here. There you go. All right, so I'm going to go back and I want to I want to send put it on fifteen hundred. Okay, so what right now I want to go back and, and I want you to show you what the different bandwidth looks like, the spectrum looks like whenever we're using that. And this goes back to the this goes back to the transmission. Okay, so first I want to send uh, NCW again. Huh? Okay, and then change the CW because it won't automatically change over. And your radio's not working. Shows receiving here, it's not getting on. So, so what? While you keep working on that, so what you would see here, if the Mac was working, <laughs> you would see. And I'm gonna see. Here's the deal, okay? We work together at the same place, right? And he's the Mac guy at work. So all day long, we go back and forth with the Mac Windows stuff, right? Okay. So what you should, should see here. CW takes up 500 kilohertz. Okay, remember it's just, all, all you're hearing is either there's a signal or there's not, on and off. And it takes up about this much bandwidth. In some of those other modes that allow more data, and the reason it allows more data is because you can make more variance in sound across there. So instead of just having uh, two characters to work with, You've got 128 or 256 characters that you can work with in combination by different tones. So in those other modes, you're going to be seeing wider and wider pieces of uh, Let's go old school, so you show you do acoustic. Okay, whatever works for you. We'll All right. So first, we're going to do CW. Except I have to send something. Okay. So now you can see that takes up very little bandwidth. So next, I want to send. I want to send something, and this is. I want to send something that has a, a handshake along with it. Uh, this. Is, so you listen to those beginning tones. In his, in this application, is going to hear those beginning series of tones and know what mode that I'm trans. Or this is the theory, anyway. I don't know if the max up to the task. So here's the handshake portion. I just see a move to the red portion. Right, and then so it automatically expands. Okay. You can see the text that I'm sending up here. C Q C Q D E W eight X R W. That's my call sign. W eight X R W. And that would be a method of saying, hey, anybody out there in the world, somebody come back to me. That's what that CQ means. All right. So now I'm going to switch to a, a mode that's that's even wider. This is Thor 50 times 2, and it should automatically pick it up again. Okay. So now all of a sudden, we're using this much bandwidth. Oh, man. Okay, so, so I'm going to be able to send information. See how much faster the text coming out on there? Same thing. So now I don't know if we're going to be able to do this with acoustic coupling just because as you increase that bandwidth usage, the, the, it has to hear better. But now I'm going to go in a really fast mode. This is PSK125 RC5. And it's and it's too much. See how it got kind of garbled there at the end. It's just too wide a bandwidth for that acoustic coupling. Now, now if at this at this distance with the signal that we have, um, if he had it hooked directly to his radio and we could skip that acoustic coupling piece, 
it'd be 100% copy. So you can see with the increase in each one of those. Uh, let's see. Let's go to uh, see if you can open up FL AMP. Okay. Now FL AMP or FL AMP is because right so far we've just been doing chat type applications, right? We're just typing out some text, going keyboard to keyboard, back and forth. Well, now what we're going to do is I'm going to transfer, I'm going to try to transfer a text file from my computer <coughs> to his computer. And we're going to add, so, so now what we've got on is this application is going to use FL Digi to send information back and forth. And this, this works more like a, oh, I don't even have a good example. Let's see if we can get it to work first of all. Maybe like a peer-to-peer -peer file transfer. Yeah, yeah. it's FTP. File transfer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a, that's probably the, the close to, closest example that, that I could think of. That's a good one. All right, so let me try to get a protocol here that won't take <laughs> forever. Or actually, let me make, make a smaller file real quick. All right, so I've got a small text file ready, and I'm going to I'm going to send it to him. So, Aaron, go ahead and uh, I'm, I'm going to send it down. Okay. Okay. So you can see I'm sending specially formatted text over to him. So it's got a header information, then it's going to send a block of information that's encoded. Kind of like a packet. What? Kind of like how packets work. It's structured exactly like a packet. You've got a header, you've got information, and and then you have a footer on it, okay? In that block of text. Actually, in a file, in a transmission. You can see that he's picked it up over here, and then he can actually open up that text file. And it's real simple. All I sent was a text file that had test in it. So it just it just took a second. So that kind of gives you the idea of, now once again, that was a real short transmission, real close range and everything else. But that just as easily could have been a list of medications that I need uh, for my Red Cross shelter that I just sent to Florida so that they can get those medications to my location. And this is the exact same technology that, that in 10 years from now, when we've got people living on Mars, that they're going to be talking back and forth with. Okay? Cell phones aren't going to work. No. You're definitely not going to run an Ethernet cable that far. Get <laughs> <laughs> Wi-Fi on Mars. <laughs> okay. Okay. Except that that goes back to the different types of wavelengths and radio signals that you can leave. They're not going to use a UHF signal just because of its characteristics. They're going to want to use something that's a little bit lower bandwidth that has a lot longer wavelength just because of its propagation. So that's where amateur radio adds on to, it's not just a computer thing, but by having that knowledge of electronics, how electromagnetic waves work, mm -hmm. that, that you can accomplish different tasks. And that would even help you with things like uh, how, to, how to locate a wireless router. Because you learn things like how to build antennas and do direction finding. Okay, and how to triangulate on signals like that. Or to gather telemetry. That uh, this is the same technology that they would use out in a gas well or in the electrical grid. You ever seen those uh, little stations that are sitting in the middle of the interstate that have, like, uh, antennas sticking out of them? Yeah. Those are, those are called Yagis, and those yeah. are, those are uh, weather 
collection station. Oh. And they're transmitting that, that weather data back to a central point via radio. Okay? So it's a set of instruments gathering data and sending that via radio, and that's called telemetry. Right? You've probably heard that term before. I'm gathering data and transmitting via radio. And it's no different than something that, that uh, a lot of makers out in California are, are getting their amateur radio licenses specifically for reasons like that. You can couple a radio with a Raspberry Pi to do all kinds of neat stuff. Remote control, remote telemetry, um, just like I was telling you with that, uh, with that repeater station here in the valley that's being controlled with a Raspberry Pi. Okay, so it's got a radio on it, and it's got a uh, it's got a serial cable that goes from that Raspberry Pi to that control unit, and they use that Raspberry Pi to control that piece of equipment via a computer and a radio, just using telnet commands. And any ham, ham mesh? Do what? You that ham mesh? Yeah. I haven't, but I've read about it. It's, it's okay, and, and what the gentleman here is talking about is uh, mesh radio. It, it's actually special software that, that you can put on the old uh, uh, WRT radio or uh, Linksys router. The old Linksys. WRTs. Yeah, WRT. Yeah, the old, yeah, the ones everybody had. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah it, it's just like, uh, on the yeah, just like putting uh, uh, tomato or DD work. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's special radio that's, that, uh, that is a special build just for, so you can go out and throw, uh, uh, a bunch of wireless routers throughout the valley. They all sync up. Uh, has anybody ever heard of uh, Ubiquity? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ubiquity. They've got they've got mesh mesh uh, mesh cap capability. Except this is homebrew amateur radio. Open source doesn't cost a thing. And there's an added advantage. I could use way more power than any of you punks when I transmit it. <laughs> okay. Because I'm authorized by the FCC to really up my game. Which means instead of just having uh, uh, five watts or less, I can go with 50 watts or 100 watts of power, which means my signal is going to penetrate buildings better, which my, means my signal is going to, going to go further than what yours is. Okay. So once again, there's another little, if you get your amateur radio license, you can do more than the average job. Authorized yeah. to do more than that. Yeah. Yeah. One thing. Keyword, authorized. <laughs> authorized. <laughs> and don't get caught because it's a $10,000 fine and a felony. Yeah. Felony? Yes. It's a felony. It's not a misdemeanor, it's a felony. Yeah. Unauthorized use of the airways. Yeah. they got to find you first. Of course. <laughs> and they got to care. Oh, yeah. We, we, were having this, we were having this conversation before this. Yeah. Is, is that's one of those things that uh, where you really got to watch is interfering with other radio services. Yeah. Okay? That if you start uh, playing around with this junk and you're transmitting on, uh, well, 2.4, okay, and you start interfering with the wireless systems at CAMC. I work there. That's fun. But, they're going to come after you. Yeah. Okay, because you're endangering people's lives. If you start transmitting on the Kanawha County Sheriff Department uh, frequency and start doing this stuff, it's not going to take them very long to come after you. If you're on the amateur radio frequencies and you're getting on there making fart noises for an hour, <laughs> nobody cares. FCC is going to come after you. So, so, but once again, I, I would never advocate illegal use of any frequency. Yeah. And that's not a joke, and there's a reason for that. Just don't do it. So Yeah, just don't do it. Just get your amateur radio license. It's easy. Yeah. We're going to offer a test tomorrow. It doesn't cost anything. You can just show up and try and guess. <laughs> you might pass. Yeah, they're doing it for free? Free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're Laurel VECs, not A double R L dollar signs. Okay. Cool. Okay, that's cost a penny. Cool. Yeah, it's going to be tomorrow, tomorrow morning. And if you and if you want to study up and have a good chance of passing, there's a free online thing. Are you ready for the URL? Hamstudy.org. H-A-M-S-T-U-D-Y.org. Doesn't cost a penny. You get on there. It's about 350 questions. They're published. It's all multiple choice. You read through there, and it even tells you the answers. 
So you scroll through there, do the answers, do some flashcards, you've got a pretty good chance of uh, passing, even just guessing based on recognizing the answers. Okay. What you say the amstudy.org h-a-m-s-t-u-d-y dot o-r-g doesn't cost a penny you can donate if you if you feel like it do what? yeah the license period is 10 years and all you got to do to renew it is say give it to me again that's just a way for when us old parts die off that uh, my call sign can be reused <laughs> And we're studying for amateur extra? Do what? No, 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 no. The technician. 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 Yeah, the very first one, it, the different levels are technician, general, general, and extra. Technician pretty much qualifies you to operate on frequencies that will work on this. Everything that we've done here today, communication back and forth, was all covered under technician. That allows you to use handy talkies. It's, it's uh, uh, two meters and up. Uh, there's a couple HF frequencies, 10 meters and that kind of thing. But that's not talking around the world kind of stuff. That's your general. But even getting that technician license would allow you to do things like operate those uh, mesh-enabled amateur, uh, because those are on those higher frequencies, 2.4. And you even get even, I mean, you've got every privilege above two meters on every band that's authorized for amateur radios that include a whole lot of experimental microwave and above frequencies. So what other questions are there? Done a little bit of show and tell, not as much show, a whole lot of tell. <laughs> you need to like sale mail and things yeah. like that. And what he's talking about sale mail there, the, the amateur radio version of that is called Winlink. W-I-N-L-I-N-K. That's what I talked about those amateur operators in, uh, in uh, Puerto Rico are using to send email with. And that's an application that... that uh, doesn't cost much, about 30 bucks or something like that to register it, and you can use it for free. But that's what would allow you to send uh, email, and, and it's just a regular, I don't suppose you have Wind Link on there, do you? Uh, not on here. Of course, my guy. <laughs> it is on Windows if I boot into Windows. Well, boot into Windows. Use that hardware for something useful. You can tell y'all the best of friends. <laughs> We're brothers, we grew up together. <laughs> All right. So, uh, but that, but that wind link is what would allow you to send, send, I use it every night, and it, and it operates, it can operate independently of the internet. The way wind link works, um, we're a little bit over, but that's okay because this is, this is interesting stuff. But the way wind link stuff works is there's, there's three main gateways across the world. There's one in San Diego, there's one in Perth, Australia, you remember where the other one is? Somewhere, secret yeah. location, I don't know. Yeah. Finland or something, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, there's three main gateways. And the way this works is a store and forward kind of system. So you've got all these person, people across the United States and across the world that run listening stations, okay? And those run, and those have pack tour modems, which are real high-speed versions of the software modems that we're doing there. So I send an email, it goes to a listening station or a radio. It has, a, it has an email server connected to that radio. That email server can either go across the regular internet to go through, it's got an inter interface to go across the regular internet, or it can actually transmit to other stations like that. So it's like a giant mesh network, and it will get that information through a store and forward system over to those three main gateways that are across the, across the United States. So whenever so whenever a uh, little Kim Jong whoever blows up all the satellites with an EMP pulse, I can still send an email to my mom and tell her what I want for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And that sounds funny, but but once again, we're talking about the lack of infrastructure, right? Internet goes away. The Chinese shut us down. The government shuts down the internet and says we're doing this to protect you, right? Well, you guys aren't talking, but I can talk to him. I can talk to that guy in the back of the room. I, I can still communicate to people whenever, whenever everything else is falling apart. And it sounds funny, but it's not so crazy anymore. I hate to have any time. Exactly. And this whole time, I've been operating off-grid. This right here is a battery. Uh -huh. Okay. My computer runs off a battery. I've got a solar panel. I'm out in the middle of nowhere, operating all day long, communicating 
off grid. So any other questions? Very interesting. How big is your bunker? Do what? <laughs> <laughs> it's called a Jeep and it's in a parking lot and it'll take me anywhere I want to go. <laughs> what kind of bandwidth can you actually get? Like what's, the, what's the max bandwidth you can get out of something like this? Well, it, once again, it depends on what frequency. Yep. Uh, and well, as, a, as you operate in your own, with your, with that, whatever that power level was, 100, 100 watts or whatever, and, and trying to get as much bandwidth as possible, what do you think? So? Well, the power and the bandwidth are two different things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, the amount of power that you can operate with doesn't affect how much bandwidth you can use. But I assume it would affect the length, so you, typically it's a trade-off between bandwidth and how far you can send, right? Eh, kind of. The, the, there's not a direct relationship between the bandwidth and the power. What the power does is, if you can imagine, compare the signal that I can put out compared to, to uh, Super 102. They're running at 50,000 kilowatts. I'm running at 50 watts. Okay? And so their signal, just on the, on the exact same frequency, is going to going to travel so much farther just because of the amount of power that that's being put out. Okay, um, so if you if you think of a fire hose, if you want to talk about power and bandwidth, think of a fire hose or a garden hose, right? So power is how how hard that stream's coming out. Like the pressure washer doesn't have to be a very wide stream, but it can peel your skin off, right? Because it's got a lot of power and there's a lot of pressure. Now, I could take a garden hose, take the top off, and I get a whole lot flowing through there, and it's wider. So the volume of water that's going through that hose is a whole lot more. I can get a gallon through that hose a whole lot quicker than I can through that pressure washer. But if I'm standing there with that, with that garden hose, I can only get it this far. But the pressure washer, I can hit him at the back of the room. So that's the difference between a relationship between power and bandwidth. Does that make sense? Yeah. My question is more like, how much, what's your throughput on? Because it seems like, it seems like this would be a great way to actually data on pen tests. Yeah, no okay, so so bandwidth and, and actual, if you compare it to baud rates, um, you're, you're limited to 300 baud on HF frequencies. That's, that's like 0.3 kilobytes. Yeah. Do what? Yeah, 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 yeah. So pretty slow. Yeah, very slow. It's like the old school, the first modems that ever existed kind of thing, back when I was a kid. <laughs> not, and that's not a joke, yeah. really. Okay, and then then on VHF frequencies, very high frequencies, that's six meter and above. Um, or six meter to 70 centimeter. Yeah. Um, that you can run at 2400 baud. So you're getting a little bit faster. Above, uh, for the UHF frequencies, it's 9,600 baud. So that'd be 9.6K, as opposed to a 56K mode. So you're, so you're not sharing any video files, ever. I mean, it's supposed to be mostly text information, text files. Um, PDFs aren't happening. So, so you're, not, you're not talking about sending executable. This is basic communication. Is that the is that the question you were answering? Or asking? I think we're out. Yeah, right. yeah I see Benny back there giving me the, the slanty eye. All right, so that's it. Thanks, guys. Absolutely.